Welcome everyone, my name is Johannes Achill Niederhauser. Today I'm joined in Philosophical Dialogue by Dr. Ryan Hecker, a recent PhD graduate from Cambridge University in Theology. He now works at the Templeton Foundation in London. And in our quite intense dialogue, we get into memory, the digital age and what it may reveal about divine reality. Blade Runner 2049, artificial intelligence, the polis as a cybernetic system, and also how we can or should relate to our civilizational memory. A very intense dialogue. Ryan is a brilliant scholar, and I hope you enjoy it. Before we begin, though, I'd like to invite you to enroll in one of my online courses which helps me support the work here. So you can find a link to my course on Heidegger's philosophy of technology in the description of this video. You'll also find a link to, the, to a course on the philosophy of the machine. And you also find several possibilities of contributing to the work on this channel, be that via PayPal or Patreon and the other possibilities mentioned, Bitcoin, etc. They will be very much appreciated if you could support the work on this channel so that I can continue. And so with no further ado, here is our dialogue. Thank you very much. Ryan, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for giving me and us your time. And please introduce yourself and then we jump right into the discussion. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be here. I have recently completed a PhD in theology and religious studies at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Rowan Williams. My doctoral dissertation was on the subject of theological interpretations of logic or the theology of logic in Origin of Alexandria as a exemplary guide for the use of logic in Christian theology. And I had surveyed the development of logic from the earliest sources from Parmenides all the way up into the present examining quite a lot of the historical developments and stages in the development of logic and developing a theological critique of some of the developments in modern logic as a way of returning to a neo-Originian and patristic conception of logic that stands in contrast both to modern mathematical logic as well as to forms of dialectical logic that operate on a plane of eminence. And I focus most of all on theological interpretations of logic and technology, but I continually ask theological questions of ancient and medieval sources as a way of drawing from their inspiration ways to respond to modern controversies. So my research is very wide ranging, but I'm increasingly focusing on, on new questions in technology studies and computers, and also as a way of integrating the studies of the church fathers with new questions in cybernetics and, and uh, digital cultures. Maybe expand on that last part a bit more and then I'll ask a follow-up question to your remarks on imminent logic, which obviously one of the main figures here would be Hegel. But I'd like to hear more first about what, what your questions are there in terms of cybernetics and logic and the church fathers or the church itself teachings. Yes, yeah, so that's quite a lot to get into, but uh, let's dive in. So I take it that that logic, one way of thinking of logic is that it's a it's a mental calculation of the ways in which we form arguments and produce new judgments through the valid forms of those arguments. And in doing so, it primarily operates at a subjective level, that is at the level of the mind rather than of things. Computers and machines, on the other hand, are ways of shaping space so that they produce new forces. That is, it operates at an objective level of the production of force and of new consequences from the way that our, we shape our space. And so in this sense, the difference between logic and mechanics is the difference between a subjective and an objective way of producing consequences. Now, the important point here is then that if, if those share in a similar form of production, then not only are the forms of logic abstract computers, but computers are in a way concrete engines of calculating with logic. So that's the essential point that I have by which I've drawn the connection between a theological interpretation of logic on the one hand and mechanics, cybernetics, or computers on the other hand, and also the point at which I believe a theological interpretation of logic also enters into an equal theological interpretation of machines and computers. How do you understand AI then? 
Yes. It... So artificial intelligence yep. is one of the key issues that theologians are called to address. And part of the reason for this is that it raises a profound question about what the human mind is, how it is related to computers, and whether computers can emulate or sufficiently surpass the cognitive abilities of a human mind. And it's one that raises a question not only about the nature of the mind, whether it's something abstract and spiritual like a soul, or whether it's something mechanical and computational, but also about whether computers can 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 exemplify those same properties, whether they can be seen to, to share in them and even surpass those powers. Now, I tend to have a very skeptical, but also a very historical view of the promise of artificial intelligence. So one thing that I would like to argue is that that what we call artificial intelligence is not simply restricted to individual computational devices, but rather it's shared through, through aggregate and concerted cybernetic systems. That is systems that are able to regulate their outputs through their inputs according to their form. And in this sense, we can say that there has always been artificial intelligence in a natural sense, that is in the sense of the generation of intelligent creatures, but also that there's always been artificial intelligence in human society as humans gather together and orchestrate their labor through the development of cities in such a way that they can have intelligent planning for how they produce new effects over time. Now, with this said, we can recognize a certain acceleration of computational ability with the invention of the modern digital computer and also with their global interface of internet telecommunication amongst all of our network devices. But it doesn't mean for that reason that 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 the possibility of, of either intelligence or of its artificial design is entirely unprecedented. Now, what people tend to refer to when they talk about artificial intelligence is a kind of as a machine learning that draws upon a massive amount of data. And whether this is indeed more, whether indeed this is this is genuinely creative or free is, is the fundamental question that uh, is raised in the distinction between general artificial intelligence and, and specific artificial intelligence. The question of whether a computer can have general artificial intelligence such that it would be able to, to compute anything at all and do so freely is a metaphysical question about whether a machine has the ability to act contrary to its design or in a way that is un, uninhibited by its original design and form. And I tend to argue, and I, I'd like to argue against this naive optimism, that that no machine is capable of producing effects that are not already in some sense shaped by its original form and design or program. And for this reason, in as far as mathematics is incomplete and any mathematical model of a machine is equally incomplete, we cannot expect that a computer on the one hand could uh, come to the the full recognition of its form, or on the other hand, reflect other than it, and as it were, decide in a way contrary to the way that its form designed and programmed. It's this fundamental limitation, I believe, of machines extends that extends also to cybernetics to computers that inhibits them from acting freely and creatively in the way that we recognize in the person of the genius, that is, someone who's able to think otherwise than the artistic form that they've inherited to create something new. So let me push back a bit. I don't fully understand why you would consider a polis a cybernetic system or artificial intelligence. I mean, cybernetics is a recent development. It doesn't even consider, concern itself too much or isn't for, based on even classical causality. Um, and would you, I mean, would you say that human interaction is purely computational or am I mishearing what you said? Um, why would a, let's say a Greek polis be a cybernetic system in the sense of Norbert Wiener? Right. Yeah, so language, by the way, is not simply in the sense of Norbert Wiener. Um, yeah. The notion of cybernetics is, first of all, a metaphor for the steering of yeah. a mechanical device, like the steering right. of a ship. And it's a metaphor yeah. that can be extended not only to the, the, reciprocal, the reciprocal cause of the outputs of mechanical systems, but also through the network of those mechanical systems and indeed also to the way that humans produce things in a mechanical way to the aggregate of human laboring or craftsmanship within a polis. It's this notion of cybernetics that was used by Plato. And in fact, in Plato's Protagoras, when he speaks about the, the gift of fire to humans by Prometheus, he immediately extends it beyond what we find in Aeschylus's Prometheus Unbound to, to describe the founding of the city-state. That is, the city-state becomes the concentrated center of the development and the exercise of new technological devices. Now, obviously, it doesn't have a central processing unit in the sense of a modern computer, whereby every every um, calculation is, 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 is reciprocally calculated, but rather um, in as far as humans gather together to discuss their activities and decide upon them in concert and even do so either democratically through um, the rhetorical theater of the Agora or, or monarchically from a single will, 
there is a concentration of intellect that is shaping continuously the total technical production of the city-state. So in this sense, I, I think it's not wrong to characterize the city-state and indeed all human associations, including great empires and indeed uh, the entire commercial system of modern capitalism as cybernetic in a very general sense. But indeed, in a very general sense, so you would you would divide this from weenus and you would want this to be uh, a different because Kubernetes, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, is the steer man or it means to steer a ship, but also through as you know, tempests. So it isn't necessarily a control grid over something that is perfectly controllable. It mm. is actually steering through. This is how it's described also by Plato, as you know. Um, or all, Heraclitus says somewhere that it is the flesh that steers, right? So, uh, so that you have it divided from that, but you would say that computers are simply, in quotation marks, uh, the next step on this natural evolution, let's put it like this, of, um, of human interaction. But at the same time, once the computer is and you could maybe, because you probably know more about this than me, when you know, there may have been earlier computers than we would think, at least in, in theory, um, maybe not built as they were in the 20th century, but at least as theoretical machines by right, Leibniz and others. But if you go as far, if you see computers as, on some level, an, a natural development of or a consequential development of what was going on anyways. And at the same time, though, they are a challenge to us. That's what I wanted to say in terms of, well, we are now confronted with something that also seems to have, at least in some respects, access to logos. Absolutely, yes. Now, this is what's so exciting about computers is that they show us in a objectified technique, something that we've created, something that can act autonomously autonomously from us, calculate and even calculate in a cognitive way or a way that appears to be cognitive, um, such that it can perform calculations not only with mathematics, but also with symbolic logic and indeed also to, to form combinations of, of all of the geometrical forms and qualities that we can have sensory access to. So it appears to be a kind of externalization of cognition and for that reason also a way of apprehending and and shaping the the forms of the the imminent logoi or the reasons of the world that share in something of the divine logos it's a way of um, as it were providing a kind of imminent concentration of the divine logos at work within the world and it's precisely for this reason that there's not only theological anxieties but also a way of appropriating computers for the purposes of theology. And this can be done, I believe, in a way that's both more or less orthodox. That is, on the one hand, you might say that the computer is yet another manifestation of the imminent logos as it's been developed by human techniques and artifice for the purpose of extending human computation and calculation. On the other hand, you can also characterize it, as I believe some thinkers in the past have been tempted to do, as a way of showing that the, the, the divine logos is somehow singularly and eventually enunciated by development of the modern digital computer, such that it supersedes and may renders obsolete all previous attempts to speak of theology, so that, as it were, the computer becomes the singular arbiter of theological truth. I mean, first of all, why does it need the computer? I have a, I have a bit of an issue, if, because it, there's a wonderful quote by Heidegger where he says, a god that needs to have his existence proven is not a very divine god. And mm. one cannot sing and praise the god of the uh, uh, the, the causa sui, the self-causing uh, cause, the, the god basically of early modern times. In what sense, though, does the, the, does the full logos here really uh, encounter us? Is it not some sort of a, a derivative of logos? Because the, first of all, the computer lacks, uh, at least to some degree, lacks the all senses especially the sense of touch we could still say mm. then we would also have to account for what what about poetry mm. what about non-propositional language yes i take your point so i'm not attempting to make the argument that i was suggesting the less orthodox one that that as it were computers are um fully exemplify and are able to to singularly accelerate in a kind of complete sense the possible expressions of the logos on earth or that they in some way are the the perfect consummation of the divine logos 
in human history. That is what I previously characterized as digital theology. That is a theology that is, is entirely qualified by an, an essential way by the invention and development of the modern digital computer. Now, what I want to argue is something I think much more orthodox, but also as you are suggesting, that the computer can be seen as yet another episode of the attempt by humans to craft within the world things by which they can think new about the world, new ways of seeing the world, new ways of exploring it and, and understanding it anew through this artificial engine of computation. And with that said, I think that um, in order to to restrict, as it were, the 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 divinity of the computer, to say that it's not it's not sufficiently powerful to, as it were, render God obsolete within the world, we have to find something more original than the computer, something more original than the automation of our calculations through technique. And as I believe you were suggesting, in Martin Heidegger and in um, many other writers beginning um, arguably with um, Cusa and Vico and with the Romantics up into the present day, we find an elevation of poesis, of making and of poetic speech as something that that is more original than techne, than the crafting of the world in a way that allows for power and control over it. And this, is, I think, is hugely important because it means then that, that the computer is in a way, a kind of automated rhetorical device, that is an automation of the rhetorical scripts and diagrams by which we have through in three dimension and through through the revolution of their of their parts, allowed ourselves to 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 create new things in a way that can write of itself to speak new about the world. But if even the fundamental program diagrams and form of the computer is itself a, a product of of poetry, that is a product of the way that we give meaning to the world through the chance combinations of, of speech and art, then we find that computers are merely a subset, but one that is extremely powerful and seductive, but nevertheless, one that can't, can't exhaust the full range of poetic and metaphor metaphorical possibilities. In a, in a more sympathetic hearing or reading of what you're saying, you'll, because, you know, to, as you may know, there, there are thinkers or someone like Shishik and others would, would say that there's something alien about um, this new time of ours. But you see it as a, there's a continuity to the entire project, beginning with, I would think, maybe Egypt, uh, but certainly with, with Plato or Parmenides even. Um, but where do you think to now turn also a bit towards how you, how we started um wh wh why why would you move back to a a logic that is transcendent rather than imminent in order to let's say make sense of our digital age well i would say that logic isn't entirely transcendent that is logic like rhetoric begins as humans attempt to frame the way they can make arguments in a way that admits for a validation of their truth. That is a way of preserving the truth of the argument or, dis or deciding upon which arguments are, are valid and invalid or truthful and, and untruthful. And as such, it, it has its historical genesis in an imminent frame. But that being said, the if the forms of logic are universal, that is, if they range across all possible arguments by which we can uh, by, and also possible ways of deciding upon the truth of those arguments, then that universal form, like other forms of thought, is not something that is is exhausted by the particular things within the world. That is, it is its truth is eternally preserved and generated, and in such a way that it shares within the total truth that is spoken of eternally from the divine logos and from and for God. And in that sense, then the forms of logic are collected like the forms of mathematics in and from the divine logos and the divine intellect and so they have a eternal origin that is transcendent even if they they um, are spoken of and shared within the imminent space of time and in the world um but with that consideration in mind i i i typically dissent from a heideggerian expectation of a kind of momentous rupture that emerges either with the beginning of metaphysics or with its objectification and automation in modern technology and i tend to think that that both metaphysics metaphysics is a way of giving a logical argument for the way in which we understand the structure of being, its enunciation, and its imminent dynamics, and various dynamics in various modes and possibilities, whereas technology is a way of capturing those powers in a way that allows us to shape the world and control it. It's not for that reason entirely um, abject or depraved. Doesn't, it doesn't necessarily cause us to, to forget its 
its point of origin or its purpose, but rather it serves as an occasion, as Heidegger at one point alludes, both to a concealing and a disclosure. Uh, that is, it shows us a new possibility, but one that was always already there, that awaited to be discovered. And um, But another one, nonetheless, one that arrests our expectation, shows us that what we had known of the world wasn't fully adequate to a description of it. So I, I have a much more optimistic view of technology than we find in many writers. Um, I believe Heidegger is ambivalent about this, but um, we might ca characterize uh, many of the sort of uh, dire prophets of doom as techno-pessimists. And I would characterize myself as a radical techno-optimist, not because I think <laughs> that we have any reason in the empirical realm of history to, to observe that technology has ever been used entirely for good means. In fact, uh, as Hegel says, history is a slaughter bench. It shows us only the sort of uh, the, the story history of our own depravity. So we can't expect that um, just as nuclear weapons, as soon as they were used, were used for warfare. So similarly, we could expect almost all new technologies to be used for the most wanton cruelty. But that doesn't mean that they can't also be used for good means as well. So nuclear energy, even though it's the foremost uh, engine of destruction, also can be an engine of creation, a way of giving new life to the world, creating endless and abundant energy that fuel fuels technological civilization. So I tend to think that if we can have hope in the final goodness of all human ambition, then we can also have hope for the way that we can use technology for our greater good. But that would be a purely, that would be a humanist project. That would not be um, in simplified technology taking over or taking, um, well, automating the human being away as, for example, Harari would say, who also mm. considers the human being to be a hackable animal which is mm. sort of the ab absolute edge of the uh, uh, superficialized understanding of Son Logon Echon as animal rationale. The, the rational animal is now reduced to a hackable animal. Mm. Uh, maybe hackable precisely because Logos has been reduced to some sort of very simplistic rationality and computation so that it is now uh, to, through behavioral psychiatry perfectly controllable, uh, nutchable, as we've heard over the past couple of years, a certain nudges that can be applied to uh, nudge the human being towards certain herd-like behavior. Um, but uh, so what Heidegger, I mean, Heidegger would, would probably refrain from both uh, the terms optimism and pessimism. They're not that far apart, just like dystopia and utopia are usually mm. uh, the same story. It's just that depending on who reads it. Uh, and and funnily enough, I mean, dystopia and utopia, in some sense, may not mean the same. That they both mean a non-place, basically, which is also mm. strike. I mean, as you know, utopia can also be a good place. But now, on, um, I think some of, one of the weirdest interviews by Heidegger is he gave to Richard Wisser, which is not the Spiegel interview that everyone knows in in the English-speaking world. But this is an interview which is only, I think, available. There are now um, segments of this interview available. In, with English subtitles on YouTube. And this, I think, is from the late 1960s. And he's asked about technology and why he's giving people headaches by simply asking the question, what is, let's say, the essence of technology? And he says, I find headaches quite healthy and good. And also, maybe you're aware of this interview, and he says, though, that he sees in it a new relationship to being that is now opening up thanks to it. He calls this Ereignis in English, either a nouning or event, depending on what side of the translation one comes down. Uh, but that's something that you alluded to also, but he wouldn't want this to be, I think, either pessimism or optimism. But in a, in a way, a, re a relationship to, to being that perhaps hitherto has been concealed or was concealed by metaphysics. Maybe you can say a bit more on this because you alluded to that also. But at the same time, um, something, something else that you mentioned is Heidegger's remark in the technology um, question essay that techniques or technology is a way of revealing. But it is, we also have to, I think, uh, mention that it is a way of revealing that can be forgetful of its of of the of the other modes and he does say also that the human being is attacked in his essence by technology mm. 
<laughs> yeah, so I take it that this is the fundamental anxiety people have about the, you might say, the the misrecognition of their selves in the mirroring of the machine. So the film Blade Runner is a very good example of this, where as soon as we've created replicants that are indistinguishable from humans, then we raise the question of whether we ourselves are not human. That is the the the, the objectification of the human in a non-human other yep. render, renders questionable the humanity that we always believed we held to begin with. and. Um, I think that the the danger here is in imagining that the other is not is not always related to its point of origin. That is, is not does not always share within some similitude that is that is shared both by the oneself, the maker of the machines, and the machines that we create. That is, as soon as we start to think about technological objects as though they conceal from us the the recognition of their authenticity or their their creative freedom and um, everything that we hold dear to ourselves, then we feel as though we've 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 lost it. We've sort of evacuated ourselves of that of that creative spirit. And I want to say to the contrary that the only reason why we believe we can find something like human autonomy and freedom in machines is because we have it from the same source. That is, it's because we both share in the same creative spark of genius and the possibility of making something new. And the specific reason for this and um, I think it's the part where I part ways with Heidegger is that I don't believe that the forms of thought conceal from us the the awareness of of our being or the being of the world that 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 is shown to us. I, I believe that they, in fact, are ways in which we observe it anew. By by which, for instance, when we count, we don't we don't forget the things that we're counting simply because we have numbers to count them with. Counting, as it way, allows us to think. In a, in a more expressed way about the things that could be counted in a way for which the numbers are virtually indicating and expressive of all of the content that is counted by their form. Now, the reason that's important, I just want to say very briefly, is I, I don't believe that that technology, in as far as it reveals something, is is must be an occasion for forgetting. I think it's certainly a liability, and we, no one has to doubt that. So, for instance, when you learn algebra, you might no longer remember that you once counted with your fingers and toes. You might forget that um, there was a kind of natural origin to, to the possibility of arithmetic. But that doesn't mean for that for that very reason that we can't always recall it. And it's for this reason also that I believe that that the use of logic or this objectification in technology is not necessarily um, a way of foreclosing from us the, the recollection of its source and the way in which we apprehend its source and discover new possibilities in the various combinations and articulation of those technological devices. So I don't believe that that either logic or metaphysics, much less technology, forecloses from us a recognition of the free creativity of the world, of the recognition and the adoration of divinity within it. And I believe it's, it would be, for that reason, very cynical to sort of imagine a, a kind of, you might say, complete foreclosure or, or um, veiling of that, that spark of creativity within the natural world as a result of its, its framing by technological devices. We often imagine that our computational devices, like our machines, are something set apart from us. So if you have, for instance, a, a toaster, it's something that sort of makes the toast that then you sort of consume it, and it's not necessarily in, related to you or in any special way. But there's another sense that was advocated by a German Hegelian philosopher of technology, Ernst Kapp, that, that technologies are external organs that are ways in which the techniques of human thought are objectified within the world. That is that we already have internal organs, like for instance, our memory and the ability to count and so on, but we use technology like for instance, the abacus or filing cabinets, or even like for instance, a chair that you sit upon that has as it were legs that you don't need to use your legs for as ways of, of externally objectifying the organs of the human mind and the human body. So in this sense, all machines, indeed, even of their cybernetic automation in computers can be considered as external relations that are objectified from the internal relations of human thought or the ways that we have captured and, and, and calculated thought through uh, the various concepts that circulate within our mind. In this sense, then, what we find mirrored in computers is not so much, is not so much a a threatening doppelganger that would subvert the original, but rather it is a kind of almost like a puppet. It's a marionette doll that we have manufactured that allows us to, to ventriloquize our own thoughts in an objective mode. It's a way of, as it were, looking back upon ourselves, interrogating who we are, but outside of ourselves in a way that's always intimately related to us and could never be what it is without us. Oh, yeah. 
So uh, very briefly then, maybe to sum summarize this, and I don't know whether you would agree with this, it's, it's through perhaps a movement of, of, ex of almost, let's say, extreme alienation that we come back to, first of all, perhaps the question what it means to be human, and to a theologian like yourself, perhaps uh, the death of God is not um, that uh, prevalent in your mind, but maybe it is, who knows? Who knows? I mean, it was Hegel, wasn't it, who first proclaimed more or less the death of God precisely because of sheer imminence of, the, of God, of the transcendent God having basically voided himself already with the birth of Christ in the world and then turning the world into a an imminent transcendence, if that makes any sense. So in, I don't know if I, I'm trying to understand whether I'm trying to see whether I hear you, whether I understand what you're saying. Are you trying to say that it is, you mentioned the computer may be a marionette or so, and it actually makes us face us in the terms, in terms of having to confront us being a mirror, and ask ourselves, who or what are we, really? So not, is that more or less uh, correct? Yes, it does certainly raise that question for us. So the very reason for this is that if, as soon as you can make, for instance, an anatomical model of the human body, you have a way of, of representing it to yourself in a way that you would never have as you inhabit it. So we, uh, we understand what we are more directly when we have an objective representation of it. And so for instance, we could not we could not dissect the brain and understand its components until we have a brain to look at. And we also cannot easily understand an organic brain as it continues to operate because it doesn't rest for our understanding. So a computer is a, a very unique way of understanding cognition because it provides us with a device that appears to be able to calculate all of the elements of human cognition, that is logic, logic, mathematics, and various syntactic forms of composition into various qualitative combinations in such a way that we can understand all of its parts and how they're gathered together in more mechanical systems. So that does certainly allow us to have a, a more transparent understanding of those operations. But the danger here is in imagining that, that, the, that who we are our subjective standpoint, our creativity, our freedom, that that is somehow evacuated and into the, the sort of fossilized remains of matter in motion that has a mere mechanical system of operations. And, uh, or imagining that it's nothing, that it was never anything more than a kind of ectoplasm that was secreted by some kind of chance combination of mechanical elements. Okay, that, that's very good. Now I understand better. Uh, maybe to come back very briefly to Blade Runner, just to push it a bit further, because we, you, you know, you mentioned the replica of synthetic human beings, who, weirdly enough, especially I think in the sequel to the film, you, uh, what was it, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, or so, uh, whatever that year, who knows? It, it's it seems that the replicas want to be human more than the humans. Mm. Uh, at least there's a certain urge within uh, the, 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 the young gentleman uh, to be, well, to try and find out if he's something sort of almost a chosen um, um, character. The, so what, what I find a bit striking though about the film is that the replicas live probably the same sort of existence that everybody else does. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference, at least what I remember. The one difference being, though, that, or maybe that isn't even a difference anymore, because it may just be that humans are also, they are fed memories. M memories are created for them because the mind mm. wouldn't work. Uh, that's something that keeps coming back in some of these, let's say, dystopian uh, future films, that you always need memories. There's another film which is qu quite bad because it's a, it's a Michael Mann film. Um, I forgot, it's, I think something, something island, I forgot. Um, but what you have there are replicas of, of living human beings who may need an organ donor at some point. Hmm. And they're being told that there was a pandemic and hence they're, they're the only survivors. And so they're trapped within a, a prison on the ground 
but they don't know really what it is that they're doing or where they are. And if the original requires an organ, they're being taken out and, uh, well, let's say put down and our organ harvested, but they can only survive as cerebral uh, beings. And so they need a brain and they need memories. So in some sense, when, you know, when you alluded to, to Blade Runner before that, that there is some, there is something, well, first of all, there's something weird about memory, perhaps because I know I've, I've, I've read parts of your paper uh, yesterday that you sent me uh, on, on, on the, which I think also addresses memory. Maybe you can speak on that a bit. I'd like to hear your thoughts, um, but also such replica. I mean, just, I mean, this is pure hyperbole, I know, but if there were to be such replicas, they, would they truly be uh, in some sense um, autonomous or wouldn't they sort of live in a, um, well, a simulation, let's mm. say, and could just a few uh, hints yes. there. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really enjoyed Denis Villeneuve's Blade Runner 2049. In fact, I thought in many ways, thematically and even visually, it surpassed the original. And I, I also found that it began where the previous film left off. That is, it answered the aporia at the conclusion of the original Blade Runner as to whether Deckard was a replicant. You may remember at the end of the original episode, Blade Runner film, having had a dream of a unicorn, he finds an origami unicorn in the hallway outside of his apartment. And that indicates that his dreams, his memories were art artifacts, that someone had known about them, had programmed them. And so having discovered that, he as it were discovers that he is likely a replicant. And he consigns himself, as it were, in that final finale to the fact that he is no more human than, than Rachel, who has is being carried along with him on their sort of destiny to the end. Now, the film 20... Blade Runner 2049 begins with the full knowledge that the new Blade Runner, played by Ryan Gosling, is a replicant. And his struggle is not, as were, to uncover whether he is, a, he is or he is not a human, but rather to overcome the anxiety of his inhumanity. That is, to discover how he can be human in spite of the full knowledge that he has been manufactured in a way that is inhuman. And the, the pivotal conflict that comes to its resolution at the end is when he recovers the notion of his anonymity, that is that he's not the, the child of Rachel and Deckard, he's not something special, but rather he's just someone else who is equally in this struggle to recover his humanity. And he does so by, by finding the, the child, their child, who is now a memory maker, someone who crafts memories and manufactures those memories to be programmed in other replicants. Now, what's astonishing about this is that it calls to mind both the, both the original and founding quality of memories for our self-apprehension, as well as how even the things that we hold to be most dear to ourselves are not made by ourselves alone, that they come from without. And this question is not unique to modern cybernetics or computer theory, even though, of course, we use the term memory to describe it. But it's something that has been explored by philosophers, in fact, at least to Augustine's Confessions, where in Book 11, I believe, he, Book 10, he discusses where his memories come from. And how his memories are a kind of vault of hidden treasures that have been given to him in a way that can show him a kind of pearl of wisdom that can lead him back to a knowledge of their original source. And the reason I, I believe that memories are so important here, and it's a theme that touches on Plato's theory of anamnesis or recollection in the Mino as well, is that they they point to something that comes behind and before ourselves, that, that transcends our awareness of the world that we experience with our senses and that we have immediate cognitive grasp of. So if you ask yourself, like, what are your earliest memories? Well, you can remember things that are things that you can only have this kind of partial awareness of, an awareness of, moreover, that is pregnant with that saturated scene in which it occurred, but also a scene that came from something beyond itself. So you might imagine, like, you, you, you remember your parents or your crib and so on, but where did that come from? It came from your house. It came from people who made that house. It came from the whole world in which that house was made, and ultimately from the entire world as it's come to be made. And so when we have access to our memories, we, we have access to something that's already been created, manufactured through a whole network of technological assemblies. And in that sense, the, the memories of the replicants aren't so dissimilarly from human memories. That is, they're the product not simply of a single program or some ingenious designer, but rather from a whole contingent assemblage of different technical operations. 
And I think it's this that is astonishing and also elicits our anxiety about the authenticity of our memory. We might wonder why it is we hold certain things to be so dear, why certain things in our history and their national past are of such great importance to us, and whether those things have any sort of great enduring meaning or whether they're not doomed to pass away, they're not, whether they're not just as contingent and for that reason meaningless as that which can be programmed by a computer programmer. So in confronting no, I, those yeah. challenges, I think he's confronting a very human challenge and one that we have with us always. Well, but, but you know, but the difference, quite frankly, is that um, those memories planted into, let's say, replicas, and that is pure hyperbole because it's just a film, but still, um, they're not contingent at all. They're programmed for the optimal use of the replicants, mm. for the machinic functioning of this simulacrum of a polis. Uh, of it's basically a tech techno version uh, in in a just a, a mental theater uh, without theos. There's no theos that shows itself mm. of of the Platonic cave, and of course there's let's say national memories. Um, you have no memory of 1776 yourself because you probably were not around. I don't want to assume your age, but I would guess you're a bit too young. So I so. But but it is in your in the collective memory of Americans, seventeen seventy six is a crucial date or year, because that's when you declared independence. And of course, now this I think would lead to a completely different discussion, um, which is a very important one. You alluded to many important authors, Plato's Anamnesis and uh, uh, Augustine's book Ten and the Confessions, where the memories come from, and. There's also, by the way, there's this weird passage right at the beginning of, of Aristotle's metaphysics, where he says the exact opposite of what we would expect. He says that it is ectes uh, nemes imperia. So it is from, uh, let's say, memory that experience becomes possible. Mm. So it, it says it exactly the other way you would, you would expect. It is from uh, imperia experience that we form memory. But he says, no, no, ectes nemes, out mm. of in the genitive form, the, the memory we form, we form uh, experience. So there seems to be, memory seems to be at stake already before we are born. This is what you also alluded to. But I would still think that there is a difference. I mean, first of all, there's contingent memories, right? Um, you, you don't know what, frankly, you, what do you remember of your childhood? You don't really decide. Uh, and it's it can be some some just completely benign things that happen to you uh, but for some reason they may come back uh, later on but they're not they weren't planted within you to to make sure that there's an optimal functioning of you uh, in society or when you become a PhD student at Cambridge uh, it may be the exact opposite you know some of these memories may hold you back and so I think that would be the difference and also they are in some sense if they were just purely talking about person memory um they are what happened to you genuinely and not they are what is just being given mm. to you on this other level that's where it gets much more complicated right because then we're with the question um what maybe you maybe you want to go there and speculate what is uh mem maybe so you know this is the the personal level but then there's much grander which what you alluded to um the memories of the soul the soul remembers the forms etc perhaps that is what is being replicated in now in this um, example of the film of um uh, replicas being have, having uh, memories implanted etc maybe there's a similarity uh, there also so but that would that would introduce some sort of a demiurge right yes indeed yeah, so I take your point entirely. So the memories we have, they're sort of gathered from our our native awareness from our earliest childhood in a way that is that is haphazard and unplanned. Whereas the memories of the replicants is something that's programmed almost like a kind of um operating system or a kind of boot system for a central processing unit that gives the replicants precisely the kinds of memories they would need in order to function. And indeed, in um, the original Blade Runner, the reason for the implanted memories is that the replicants have to have some awareness, some ancestral, some childhood awareness of their growing up so that they do not remember that they only have four years to live, that they have a short lifespan and they only have this single purpose. That being said, I think that there's 
there's the same question arises for us as to whether our memories are authentic or not, or whether that they're they're somehow the product of a of a as you were a, a concerted operation of controlling and producing that historical awareness for ourselves. And you raise the example of the date of the American the American uh, independence that is the um, the Declaration of Independence from England and the way that's been rehearsed as a kind of mythic origin for America. And the reason I think this is really compelling is because it shows us how, as a as a nation, Americans have 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 told themselves a story about their point of origin that demarcates them from the British on the one hand and the Native Americans on the other hand. That is, it's a way of consolidating the origins and developing a concerted national story for how it is they came to be and what their common destiny could be. So in this sense, the not only the memories we have of our past, as well as our history, are the product of certain activities of selection that serve certain goals. So just as, for instance, the replicants are given memories about their childhood that allows them to optimally function for certain social purposes. Similarly, the way that we decide upon our history is often the reflexive response to certain challenges that require that we have some kind of original story from which we can understand our point of origin and our subsequent purpose. Now, the reason I think this is hugely important for us is because it means then that history is never not filtered by forms of um, by 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 forms of remembrance that serve certain ends for ourselves. That is the reason why we remember things not only in our own lives but also collectively in our history is because they are their ways of reinterrogating our past for present purposes. It's always it's always drawn back towards um, the needs of the present and the the stories that we tell for those purposes. I was doing quite a lot of work on Tertullian and Irenaeus this morning and looking through some of the, the summaries of their writings. And one of the things that becomes very apparent very quickly is that different Christian traditions have different ways of sifting the, the documents and the, the, key, the key doxa or opinions of the church fathers. So even the way that we understand texts that are even still available to us for our own transparent gaze is something that has been sifted and managed and curated for certain certain ends of ecclesial communities, of ways of, of, of orchestrating practice and devotion. And we can say something similar about the, the history of the United States or indeed the history of the world. So if this is the case, if the, if the cybernetic engines of production, of social activity are also the, the medium by which we curate the past and transform it in the activity of interpreting it, then the memories we have are never exempted from this artificial process of producing the past for the present. And the, the danger here is a danger that we find also in George Orwell's 1984, when Winston Smith works at, I think, I believe the Ministry of Truth. And you may remember his um, his work is to, to go to historical monuments and to efface them. That is to, to as it were, re-encode the past in a way that always serves the present moment. And I think the general danger that we're facing today as a society is we have so many artificial means of remembering the past that can not only show us something that is adulterated, but also even can overcode it in such a way that we can't remember its authentic appearance. So we are, I mean, we're not only tearing down statues, but we also are changing our curriculum and we are, we're, um, we're developing new ways of learning about the world that serves our imminent purposes, what purposes that aren't always conducive to human flourishing, but may serve certain ends that are that disadvantage large communities. So um, I, you can talk about, for instance, the way that there are curriculum battle in universities. We can talk about how there are faculties that are being closed. We can talk about how we are uh, producing sort of new historical epics that um, single out certain narratives and events at the exclusion of others. All of these things are ways in which we're fighting over our memory and trying to either hold on to or to to transform it in a way that serves new social ends. And I think all of this testifies to how our memories are contested and produced in a way that always calls to, into mind the question of their authenticity. It, it does. It, it goes just maybe as a side note, it goes right to the part of what I've been trying to work on or have been working on for many years now and um, I'm currently writing this actually by hand because it's a different uh, uh, practice and also by of course a different practice of memory to try and write something by hand because you there's no search function uh, if you actually uh, write um, just in a notebook but the I, I can follow everything up up until the, the the last one where I think that there's a bit of a, a leap where where you say well if, if there is that much um, uh, 
struggle or strive or battle over what our memories are. Hence, maybe they're never really authentic to begin with. Um, that to me, I think is a bit too extreme. I think if, because that ultimately what, what this might lead to is just arbitrariness. Uh, and um, I, I'm not suggesting that you're saying this, but if, if we go that uh, to me, maybe, you know, you'd, you'd like to push back and say, no, you misunderstood me. But maybe it's a bit too, uh, too crass to just then come out the other end and say, well, maybe nothing ever is fully authentic. Maybe, maybe precisely because it is, there are authentic uh, uh, memories, even if there are unpleasant ones. Um, that's precisely why they need to be destroyed. And though to come back to what you know, your explanation was on point because you always mentioned uh, Orwell, etc., and our current moment, let's say, what could be the results of this? But I, I don't know if you would agree with this or not. Um, is that maybe we already are there anyways, is a certain, is a, is a weird destruction of memory that produces, say, artificial memories, a simulacrum of memory. So it's sort of, it, it works against memory. It cuts us off from what in German we would uh, call Sinn zusammenhang, the, the context or the web of, of sense, of logos, and uh, wants to begin this. I'm jumping around a bit now, but we, you know, wants to begin at point zero, um, uh, have a complete tabula rasa and uh, start from scratch. Um, so maybe I misheard you, maybe I didn't follow entirely your very uh, eloquent argument, but I'd like to know if I maybe misinterpreted you, but I'd also like to know if you would think, if, you would, if, I, could, if I was able to, to get across what I'm trying to say say it again, um, that we are, but even though we're trying to abandon memory, we're at the same time using memory to create a new sort of uh, being mm. that is, however, not grounded. Yes, that's brilliant. I believe that the question and challenge of history is one that has become more paramount in the present day. The reason for this, I believe, is that we have witnessed in the past 60 years, arguably since the end of the Second World War and the May 1968 protests, an attempt to re reproduce the world in a way that has no, no direct precedent in the past, and in a way that can, can allow for new possibilities to emerge that were not constrained by previous forms of human association practice. I believe that this has, this has created a society in which we have used our technological modes of communication and production to, to, to render the world entirely new without any link to the past. And the focal point of this discussion often comes back to the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard, who in his Mirror of Production and in um, Simulacrum and Simula and in his work Simulation and Simulacrum, had argued for the, the accelerated production of new symbolic commodities and forms that would supersede and overcode all of the forms of remembrance that come to us that we've inherited from the past. It calls into question whether there is any truthful remembrance, whether everything that we claim to remember is not something we're simply inventing. That is, all discovery is simply invention and all invention is simply production. And I believe that in order to answer this question, in order to find a way to remember truthfully, we have to return to the possibility that was disallowed to us by by Leotard, which is the possibility of a grand narrative or a genealogy that looks back from this present moment to a successive ancestry of formative stages of the development of our social life and our even our technical activities. And in order to do this, we have to find something in history that shows us the possibility of truth. And I believe this is the the, the signature challenge both of, of a kind of amnesiac postmodernism that doesn't admit for the possibility of either historical moments that were truthful and good, or on the other hand, a way of recalling that and representing that in the present, as well as I believe for theologians who who deny to us the possibility of finding, finding a way in which the divine truth or that which is that which is eternal can be shown to us in moments of time that have enduring resonance for our self-understanding. So I believe the challenge for us today is how is it where we can find something in the present that recalls to us not just 
the moments of the past that have passed away, not just the particular moments that have been formative to us, but something of the what Schelling had called the eternal past that is always available to us at this present moment, and finding the narrative links within it that can be sustained in a way that admits for the preservation of its truth, not only through logic, but also through its objectified media of technology. And without this, I, I'm afraid that we are liable to not only to misremember, but also to remember wrongly the forms of the past and to overcode them in a way that in becomes increasingly agonistic in the violent contest of conflicting memories. Conflicting memories that can be the occasion, as in George Orwell, for weaponization of the past, for the empowerment of the nation state and of the domination of our memories and passions in the future. I have to give the compliment back. This was absolutely brilliant. It, it, it strikes me so much because um, I'm having more and more conversations with different um, uh, scholars of, of different uh, disciplines. Some of them actually work in AI. Uh, one of them is Sean McFadden, um, who is a young gentleman from, from Germany with an Irish name, but he's also worked at the Cambridge um, at the uh, an AI research um, project. And we always, for some reason, come back to memory. It, there's always a, a, a return to the question of memory, but also to this sort of weird resignation of the second half of the 20th century in philosophy, maybe also in theology, I'm not too aware. But what I'm hearing also is, and this is a young century. We could actually also say it's a young millennium. Hmm. Uh, and we are also young enough, maybe different uh, types to speak like Nietzsche a bit. There's, there's also, there seems to be among academics, scholars, um, independent intellectuals or so, a bit of a, a, I don't want to use the word, reawakening sounds a bit too esoteric or new agey, but some sort of a, a, re, a, a new appreciation of, uh, of memory in a new light that goes beyond, that maybe takes into consideration and takes seriously the concerns and the attacks of postmodernism, which are, some of them are legitimate, uh, but also try to not just stay with it as dogma, but overcome them. Um, and you mentioned something very important also, that there are moments where truth shows itself and we can find them. And I think you and your work, if I hear everything right, you're trying to show that this can also occur or show itself to us through technology and through the computer, through the digital. Even. So it's not the end, let's say, or a completely new a cut and then something else alien to us happens. But instead, it could be a moment where truth is revealed again. Yes, very much so. I've been persuaded of this, not just by my studies of modern media culture, but even of my studies of the Church Fathers. So I take it that one of the great questions of history and antiquity was, where does truth come from and how can we continue to recall it? There was a great German philosopher named Karl Loweth. He wrote a book titled The Meaning of History, and in it he distinguished between the, the cyclical model of history that was held by, by Greek philosophers from Heraclitus to the Stoics, from the radical messianic and promissory conception of history that was spoken of by the Jews and, and celebrated by the Christians, in which the messianic promise pointed to a kind of continual spiritual progress. Now, I believe this has significance for not only how it is we rhetorically orchestrate our speech of what is true, but also how using objectified media, we can disclose and discover that again. And my contention here is just as for origin of Alexandria, it was possible through the translation of the Septuagint and the interpretation of the scriptures to discover new meanings that were always already evident, but always already present, but not yet shown in their full significance without the interpretive activity of the commentator. So similarly, I believe that, that with modern technology, with computational devices, with the internet and everything else that we've invented, we are finding truths that were present to be found, but only for which we are only able to show and celebrate through the inventions we've made and through the ways that we continue to act upon to shape the world for higher purposes. So my contention here is that, is that we are in the position now to 
and we will be forever afterwards to to find that truth that has been planted, the seed of which is yet to be come to its fruition and perhaps won't come to its fruition for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years to come. But for which also um, the finding of it will also always be a recollection of how it has been planted, where it has been given to us in history and the way in which we can always return back to it. In a Christian sense, this is to return back to the source of scriptures, that is to the source of prophetic inspiration towards the incarnation of God made man in the person of Christ. And equally, I believe um, from other religious traditions, we can look to our sacred scriptures revelation as a way in which the, the, the passing of the past at every moment has been punctuated in such a way that preserves its truth and shows us something of eternity and time. There is something weird about our time also. Many things are weird, but there's something in particular that's weird, which is maybe all too obvious. And so it's not a question or not weird to anyone but me for some reason. I find it strange that we have access now to many, if not most all, of the fundamental texts of the canon, be that the Greco uh, tradition. Um, we've also covered and retranslated um, Egyptian hieroglyphs. We have at our fingertips um, the entirety of, 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 of at least what's, what, what survived um, of the fundamental um, texts and therefore sources that make up, let's say, uh, the Occident, but also, of course, sp spanning now um, the entire globe uh, and access to that, at least in terms of pure um, objectified availability. That, to me at least, and perhaps that's a strange remark, but that I think it's a, it's rather recent. I'm not entirely certain that there were uh, translations going around about just about any uh, pre-Socratic philosopher as they are now available. Mm. Um, and, and all, right? So th that is, and on top of that, the Japanese thinking, the, the Chinese uh, civilization and, and their uh, incredible wealth of, of texts, that stands at our fingertips. So in some sense, there is to put it simply intense uh, cultural memory. But at the same time, the question becomes then one of how do we, and this is something I think that you were, maybe you didn't say it, but maybe that was implied. What sort of an access do we find to these texts? But maybe also if I'm allowed to be a bit um, um, uh, enthusiastic now, uh, uh, it could just be uh, that through this, um, digital virtual weird world that we're entering or maybe are already completely in that we are addressed by this availability of texts in order to find something that to paraphrase what you said much more literally than me that has always been present but hasn't yet been seen or not yet been articulated so perhaps you know there is ultimately some sense to all of this <laughs> Yes, I was often astonished when I was younger, when I was studying at college, as to why I was able to find so many incredible gems of wisdom and knowledge in the great authors of the past that were transformative and had great impact on the modern day in such a way that they'd never yet been acknowledged. And that I was, as it were, the, I felt, in many ways, the only person going to the library in the evening to find these books and to to look through them. That is, why is it, why is it not that everyone else is sort of digesting this vast wealth of wisdom that we have at our fingertips. It was pointed out to me at one point, I think it may have been Carl Sagan, that we now have on, and this was, by the way, in the 1980s, we now can go to a library and we can have access to, to hundreds of thousands of more materials than the ancients and the medievals had in their entire lifetimes. And indeed, now with um, the internet, you can basically access all ancient Greek, Latin sources, uh, anything, anything an encyclopedia entry to tell you about almost anything you can conceive of. But that mere quantity of information doesn't mean that we're wiser today. It doesn't mean that we have thought through it in any more profound way than people in the ancient world. And in fact, it may even be an occasion for distraction and for the dislocation of that very attention that sustains the possibility of reflection and interior development. So a very good example of this is that um, in, in Plato, 
uh, he's often said to have had two ways of speaking, that is, esoterically and exoterically. So e exoterically, he would he would present he would present his teachings to the public. Uh, he's recorded, for instance, to have given a lecture on the good that was attended publicly. Esoterically, you might think say that he had um, his dialogues where he his students would read alongside him, and they would presumably be some kind of recording of the way that he had taught his students within the academy. And even beyond that, there may be another level of teaching that he refers to in the seventh letter of those truths that he never recorded in writing in his dialogues. Now, Plato, I believe, had a very deliberate reason for for concealing his thought from the public. And we know this from in part from Aristotle and other testimonia of his lecture on the good when he was ridiculed for speaking publicly about his beliefs. It was the same reason why the Pythagoreans held their beliefs in secret, which is that although they had great significance, they couldn't be understood immediately to someone who hadn't, as it were, spent seven years without speaking, cultivating an understanding of what those could mean. And so we have all of this information available to us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we've had the time to attend to it and reflect upon it in a way that will cultivate that understanding in our mind that will allow us to think more richly about it. Having the text in Greek and Latin is no help if you cannot read Greek and Latin. It's no help if you don't understand the thought world to the people who produced it. Even if you have a, a very good translation of these ancient authors, it, need, it, it could in many ways mislead you into thinking that you know them better than you in fact do, because we've, we're all the more distant from the the culture and the, the house of language that created these texts. So I fear that we have a great technological transparency of a vast wealth of information, but that very transparency could give us an undue optimism for our ability to, to come to a greater appreciation of what is meant to be conveyed by those words. And I feel that if we don't have humility with with respect to the moment in time in which we have been given this information, we are liable to to misappropriate it or even to forget it entirely. Yeah, to, yes, to, it comes back to something we said before, to, to forget while there is still some sort of remnant memory uh, bustling about. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Ryan. Yes, well, thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs>